You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. You know, there, there is no physical metal flying around at these prices. You know, you go, you try to go buy some silver right now at, you know, sub $15 an ounce. Um, you know, you couldn't buy physical metal for under $15 an ounce right now, despite the fact where, where the paper is trading. The paper market just goes to show you there's absolutely no um, relationship between the physical market and the paper market. And it's now proven. And what I'm hoping is that people are going to finally wake up to that fact. I've been saying this for years now. And I think, you know, maybe people are finally coming around to the fact that, the, you know, these banks, you know, including the Federal Reserve, do not have the best interest interest of investors in mind and uh, you know they don't really you know care about uh, the normal investor on the street and uh, you know they'll trade these paper markets as long as they can make money doing it and uh, you know I think it's up to you know the miners to pull the supply off the off the table so there's no metal in the COMEX and I'd love to see that happen. Thank you for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I am your host, Bill Powers. If you'd like to engage the show or the content I produce, feel free to email me at bill at miningstockeducation.com. Well, if you followed my podcast over the years, you know I am a big silver bull. I like investing in silver juniors. And in 2016, one of the best performing juniors that I own was, well, it wasn't a junior. I guess it became more of a mid-tier, was First Majestic Silver, which I saw go from about, I think it was 273 a share U.S. to over $19 a share U.S. in six months. And the CEO, founder and president of First Majestic Silver is on the show again. It's been a while since I interviewed Keith, but Keith, thanks for coming back on Mining Stock Education. And to begin with, could I get your commentary on what's been going on, um, not in the silver price, but in the gold price on the COMEX, where on Tuesday of this week, we saw $100 spreads. There's been a lot of speculation that there was a failure to deliver, a commercial signal fail. What do you think's occurring here? Well, uh, nice chatting again, Bill. Uh, it's been a while, as you say. Um, um, you know, these markets are unprecedented. And, and uh, you know, I think, you know, looking back, you know, six months from now, maybe we'll be able to have all the answers of exactly what's been going on. But, you know, we've seen this market uh, gyrate around not just the metals market, but also the equity markets and, you know, ETFs trading at sub nav values uh, to the underlying equities. Uh, uh, you know, where there's just no bid on anything and uh, no one can sell fast enough to to generate the cash necessary to pay back redemptions. And and I think we're saying seeing the same thing in the in, in the in the metals market as well. It's the same supply demand but uh, issue where there's just zero liquidity. And you've got a situation where the refineries can't deliver the metal as quickly as it's necessary. And it just goes to show you how tight this market has been for so long. And it just required just a small little disruption, and not that this is small, but um, you know, a, a, a disruption to to the point where all of a sudden, you know, these dealers who are guaranteed these uh, these supplies of physical metal, all of a sudden can't uh, get it, and then uh, now they're having to fulfill contracts. And you know, what I'm seeing is probably exactly the same thing you're seeing. That it looks like a dealer had to uh, quit the Comex uh, just overnight, and. Uh, you know, interesting piece of news that also came out yesterday or the day before was ABM Ambro uh, sent sent a letter to all their clients saying uh, we no longer will allow our clients to trade the gold futures market. And um, if you have any positions, uh, you have to sell them immediately. If you don't sell them, you were going to sell them for you and close your account and you can no longer invest in these instru instruments ever again. So. There's a lot of pretty bizarre things going on out there. So would you say that everything that we're seeing is going to work in the favor of the gold bugs this year? I think mean, it's all all supportive for gold. Um, you know, the uncertainty, of course, the markets um, always create some under underlying bid, but also the um, uh, dropping interest rates will, uh, you know, we've seen the U.S. Uh, bond cur uh, turn around again, going lower. That's going to help gold. You know, we're going to see interest rates and money printing continually happen around the world. You know, this coronavirus, um, you know, was the pin that popped the bubble. You know, we, we didn't know what the pin was going to be. We knew the bubble existed. This bubble has been going on for quite some time, taking these markets to pretty amazing uh, levels. And, and uh, 
um, there was a lot of complacency coming into the market, and all of a sudden, you know, and it was computers that drove it. It was computers that drove it all that way, and then uh, now, you know, on the opposite side, you know, it's the computers driving everything down, and then there's just simply no bids. But uh, it is, you know, it's it's we knew it was going to happen. We just didn't know what what you know what's going to cause it. Keith, I believe your background is that of a trader, if I recall correctly, in your earlier career. When you That's look right. at the markets as they are, uh, not just the gold markets or the gold sector, but just the markets in general right now with all this volatility. Is this a trader's market or even the trader instinct in you? Would you just stay away from this type of market? Yeah, no, I, I've, you know, I, that was what was my history, of course. I, I spent 10 years uh, or close, well, almost 10 years uh, with three different banks back in the 80s uh, working on the floor, the stock exchange, you know, using their money to trade equities or arbitraging equity, equities across Canada and the United States. And, you know, it's been a very interesting background and it's given me a lot of um, understanding of the public markets, the financial markets. And I think it's helped as CEO of, um, you know, running public companies to have that uh, background. But no, this market is untradeable, um, at least in my view. I, I have some very close friends of mine that have uh, lost uh, substantial amounts of money. Um, I'm talking about north of 50% of their portfolios. Um, and, you know, some of these are relatively large portfolios. And, and uh, you know, it's pretty pretty sad to see that. And, you know, these are smart individuals who, you know, who had, you know, leverage in the system, you know, with, with a bet that obviously didn't, didn't go right. And, uh, you know, you had everything dropping, you know, it didn't matter. Like, you know, if you're long oil, you got, if you long even gold, you know, there was a, a period of time you're doing very well, but in the last couple of weeks, it's been pretty difficult. The silver market's been difficult, you know, palladium markets drop substantially, you know, the equity markets, you know, there's not a place to hide out there. And uh, I just think that you have to take a step back and then watch this market for the next couple of months and um, you know, I wouldn't be chasing anything right now. One um, ratio that precious metal traders look at, as you know, is the gold-silver ratio, which has reached all-time highs, I believe, of like 120. However, I think we pull it out of the ground at about 9 to 1. Re from a trader's perspective, I mean, is this ratio irrelevant now? Because I remember every time I would see this ratio get to about 86, I think to myself, okay, you know, with just a reversion to mean trade says jump into silver, but it's been meaningless at least the last few months. What's your commentary regarding uh, the gold-silver ratio? Well, it goes to show you how, you know, how much of a fallacy or, or how much of a joke, you know, this whole mar market is, you know, where, whereby... You know the paper markets dictate the 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 value of the metal that we take out of the, out of the ground, which is uh, it, right from the beginning is the wrong way of pricing the, the the commodity, the metal. You know, it's like the dog, you know, or the, the the tail wagging the dog. You know, it should be the other way around. It should be the suppliers to the miners of the metal who should be fixing the price, and and uh, the paper market is there to facilitate transactions. Uh, for, to allow miners to hedge or, or to allow big consumers like, you know, Sony or Toyota or, you know, Samsung or whomever to to hedge uh, on the other side of the market. That's what the market was designed for. It wasn't designed to, you know, have 300 uh, short ounces for every one ounce of long uh, of metal. That's what is causing the problem we're seeing is because we're just simply, um, you know, there, there is no physical metal flying around at these prices you know you go you try to go buy some silver right now at you know sub fifteen dollars an ounce um you know you couldn't buy physical metal for under fifteen dollars an ounce right now despite the fact where where the paper is trading the paper market just goes to show you there's absolutely no um relationship between the physical market and the paper market and it's now proven and what i'm hoping is that people are going to finally wake up to that fact i've been saying this for years now and I think, you know, maybe people are finally coming around to the fact that, the, you know, these banks, you know, including the Federal Reserve, do not have the best interest of investors in mind. And, uh, you know, they don't really, you know, care about uh, the normal investor on the street. And, uh, you know, they'll trade these paper markets as long as they can make money doing it. And, uh, you know, I think it's up to, you know, the miners to pull the supply off the off the table. So, 
there's no metal in the COMEX, and I'd love to see that happen. When you look at what we've seen over the last month, and in, in particular the last couple weeks, in conversations I've had over the past week, some have likened it to an accelerated 2008. Others have said it's a 1929, except much faster. What would be your closest historical comparable? Well, I wasn't on the floor in 1929, so it's, <laughs> it's just, you know, I read the information, obviously, what you've probably read. Uh, I was on the floor in 1987, a very, very interesting experience, and something I'll never forget. You know, you know the Dow Jones down 25% in one day was um, pretty amazing. Uh, we haven't even seen those types of moves even in the last couple of months. We, you know, obviously we've seen some pretty amazing records being created, but uh, that one still has not been uh, uh, broken. Um, and then, of course, I, I lived through the um, uh, you know the dot com bubble in 2000, 2001, and it's somewhat similar to that. Um, um, you know, where you have an exodus of uh, story stocks, and, and and you've got money kind of chasing value. We saw a glimmer of that where, you know, gold and silver and well, the metals started to move higher um, with the equity markets rolling over. But then it just now it's just become this huge liquidity event where everything's now being sold uh, just to convert into U.S. dollars. And that's why the dollar's been so strong and everything else has been so weak. So that's reminiscent of what happened in 2009. So there's, you know, parts of 2001 and parts of 2009, I think, that this current market looks like. And. You know, don't forget back in April 2009, silver was 20 bucks. It was a little bit over 20. It was close to 21. And silver dropped all the way to around $9 in November of 2009. And that was when the entire market was just being killed. And then, uh, um, then everything turned around and the money started flooding into the resource sector in early 2010. And lo and behold, we, you know, within 18 months, we had silver at uh, $50 an ounce and, and gold at $1,900 an ounce, and that's kind of what I'm expecting to happen, um, you know, those types of uh, moves over the next uh, year or two. Do you have a time frame in terms of months? Uh, do you think the second half of this year will be good, or could this crisis we're in the midst of potentially hinder the mining sector for the rest of the year? Well, you see the the way the market's bouncing yesterday and today, um, you know, the Dow is up, you know, uh, 11% or something, which is unheard of in one day. I think it was another record broken. Um, uh, yesterday and then it's a gain up this morning. Um, you know, so the money is just looking for a bottom. You know, they, they, this is a very much a, a, a buy the bottom market. You know, people that have been buying the dip um, over the last 10 years have actually done very well doing it and has proven the right trade. I have a sneaking suspicion that's not the right trade this time around. I think that um, um, these major rallies we're seeing in the uh, big equity markets need to be sold into and uh, um, you know people need to be looking at, at moving some of their capital into the mining sector um, slowly I wouldn't do it all at once for sure um, you know I'm expecting you know the next two to three months to be pretty rough and what I mean by what I mean by that is they're very volatile where we're going to continue to see you know these five to ten percent moves in stocks and, and, and indexes on a daily basis um, uh, until this really settles out and until this virus you know, just starts to disappear and and the supply chain start to be rebuilt and uh, supply, supplies start to get delivered, you know, to, to stores and so on and so forth and people can get back out of their homes and start shopping and start going to restaurants and get, get back in their offices and that's not going to happen overnight. That's going to take at least a you know, good chunk of the summer. So I think we just have to wait this out for the next couple of quarters. But, um, you know, I think, the, you know, you pick your spots and the right stocks over the next, you know, three, four, five months. I think you could do quite well on the other side of this trade. Keith, I have some questions that are specific to uh, First Majestic. As I've conversed with uh, some friends, I wanted to post to you some objections they have, potential objections they have to investing in First Majestic. And the first one would be the average all-in sustaining cost. Uh, of production and as we speak silver it is what it is the spot price says it's about 1450 and then your guidance that I looked at for this year had it at, at about 1350 to about 1550 the average all in sustaining costs so what would you say to potential investors about your cost of production relative to the spot price yeah the these uh, cost numbers are all based on budgets right so so 
um, all the sustaining costs catches a lot of stuff that we do that isn't really necessary to be done sometimes, you know, like, you know, expanding um, expansionary or, or expanding uh, sustaining expiration, you know, which, which, um, you know, what is, you know, it's always the debate, you know, what is sustaining versus what is expansionary, but um, the all in sustaining cost catches a lot of stuff that, you know, we have some wiggle room on. And, and um, you know, we came into 2020 with a pretty strong um, balance sheet, you know, north of $165 million, um, you know, decent uh, metal prices, um, as we all know, you know, $18 silver, you know, $16.50 plus uh, gold, you know, what, um, uh, projecting to have, you know, over $150 you know, million in free cash flow for the year approximately. I forget the exact number, but, you know, somewhere around that number, you know, so it's a pretty... So we came into 2020 with a pretty strong capex number, which show which translates into a slightly higher all of sustaining cost number compared to 2019. Now, of course, based on what's happened in the last couple of weeks, you know, we've proven to be a pretty nimble company. This is not the first time we've gone through turbulent markets, and uh, we've already cut several million dollars from our budget just in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we have to do things like that. We have to be nimble. We have to be able to move quickly when, when, when the environment around us changes. You know, we know we don't have control over the price of the commodity that we sell. Uh, we do have control over the prices that we um, uh, it costs us to produce those those products. So um, it's that what it's it's that what we do have control over, and those are the changes that are occurring currently. We'll be putting out our our Q1 production numbers in a couple of weeks. And we'll be addressing uh, this exact topic uh, in that news release. So I would uh, suggest that your listeners uh, wait for that news to look some look for some more details on this topic. The second objection that's been shared with me is in regards to the debt the company carries and how that could potentially be a lid to the share price. Uh, could you address this, please? Yeah, I don't think we really. I, I don't think of debt um, um, the way maybe other people do. Um, um, you know, we have a convertible debt. Um, which, which is what I gather you're referring to. Mm -hmm. um, a debenture. Which is, yeah, the maturity is uh, five years, and then that's at 9.85 US per share. Um, you know, going back to November, December, January, February, the stock was well above that price. Um, the stock was in the 12 to 14 US dollar range uh, for, for parts of that period, I believe. Um, so it didn't act like a lid then. Um, um, you know, if you look at the total value of, of, or the total amount of shares, you, know, you do the math. I'll um, I'll uh, do it right now, uh, just for the sake of this interview. But um, um, it's not very much. It's 156 million dollar convertible uh, divided by 0.985 equals. Uh, you know, it's 15 million shares, which is you know our stock trades. Uh, you know, five to, you know, or at least three to seven million shares a day. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the most liquid mining stock on the planet trades its entire float in any quarter. Um, you know, and any, you know, seller out there with any kind of size has a lot of, uh, flexibility on how they could liquidate positions. So, uh, I'm never concerned about that. And, and, um, you know, it's, uh, the interest rate is amazing. You know, we, we we took that down that 156 million dollar convertible down in um, uh, just to acquire the San Dimas mine in in, uh, in 2018, and our interest rate on that loan is 100 was 1.875 percent interest. So you count you you know you tell me where you can get 1.875 percent interest money, um, you know for five years. You know we we should have taken a lot more to be quite frank with you. Um, it was dirt cheap money, and uh, it's great we did it, and, and and saved our shareholders a ton of dilution. So uh, you know the stock, because the stock was trading at about six bucks at the time we did that financing, and we were able to get convince the banks to take uh, the conversion rate at, at uh, over nine dollars, well actually just less than ten dollars. So they gave us a substantial premium uh, from the current market levels at the time we did that deal. What about your reserves? Uh, what do your reserve, silver reserves uh, look like? And another objection is uh, the amount of reserves you have relative to your market cap. Yeah, I don't really 
look at that either. Um, I'm not quite sure where you're getting these questions from. It's funny. You, 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 you seem to get different questions than I get when I'm traveling around the world. But and then, nevertheless, the, the ounces, uh, we're putting out new um, resource estimates uh, actually next week. Um, uh, we do that every year. Uh, this time every year we put out our brand new numbers for all the mines. And, um, um, you know, we've been drilling quite a lot. Um, we had drilled over 220,000 meters of drilling in 2019. We're, we're doing around uh, 180,000 meters of drilling in 2020, which uh, we're cutting, but we're looking at that budget right now just based on current environment. But um, so the drilling is, is, is pretty active. Um, um, you know, it was close. we've got close to 500 million ounces of silver, you know, combined overall categories. Um, you know, the life of mine, which is more important, um, is, is uh, it's what I pay more attention to. Um, um, at San Dimas, for example, using San Dimas is, uh, first would be about it's north of 10 years. It's actually, I think it's like double that number. Uh, Santa Elena is um, um, just with the Euro um ore body. It's it's a, it's north of ten years as well, uh, and um, then La Cantata is is one where the shorter mine life exists. It's about two or three years, but um, it's it's been that way for you know we've had it in our portfolio for uh, fourteen years now, and it's always had a two two year mine life. Um, so it's just the type of ore body that is. It's a, a very sporadic kind of. Uh, um, brecciated, um, a broken ore body, which is very, very difficult to drill um, and, and actually put a, a, a bigger resource around it. It would just cost too much money and it's really just not worth it. So, you know, we just accept it um, at, at that. But um, so those are the three core mines, um, all of which will be producing silver well into the future. So for future growth, are you looking to, it was one metal, one country, are you still looking to stay in Mexico or is there a potential to expand beyond Mexico for future growth projects? We have looked around outside of Mexico. You know, we know Mexico very well, obviously. You know, I put the company together 18 years ago and I wanted to focus on, on you know, silver as best as we can. You know, over time we've learned that it's pretty difficult to stay 100% silver. It's actually virtually impossible. Um, um, you know, because, you know, Mother Nature does throw curveballs at you whereby, you know, these rocks you're pulling out of the ground, uh, um, you know, have other metals in them. And sometimes it's lead, sometimes it's zinc, sometimes it's copper and sometimes it's gold. And, and we've produced, uh, you know, lead and zinc and, and silver and gold throughout you know, our, our history. And, and uh, um, this year, 2020, because we did have two closures in 2019, we closed um the La Priya operation and the Del Toro operation. And then uh, they were both concentrate producers, um, uh, La Priya lead and, and uh, zinc and, and Del Toro just lead. So 2020 is the first year since I think 2006 that we're actually producing just two metals, uh, silver and gold at a ratio of about 60% silver and 40% gold. But even at 60% silver, it makes us... Uh, uh, the purest uh, silver company in the world out of the larger, you know, uh, silver companies. So most silver companies, you know, produce much less than 50% of their revenues from silver, um, you know, just due to the fact that, uh, you know, you mentioned it yourself in the, earlier on in the interview that we're mining nine to one for one every one ounce of gold being mined worldwide. We're only being, we're only mining nine ounces of gold, which is a pretty crazy number. But the reason why that is is because these silver mines are just a lot rarer than people think they are. When you look for new projects, you were involved in um, helping found Silver One, which focuses primarily in Nevada and Arizona now. Perhaps you could share with listeners uh, what your expectation is for Silver One and also talk about what you look for in a potential project that First Majestic would acquire. Yeah, okay. Well, they're totally two different animals. Um, um, you know, at First Majestic, um, you know, we're, we're producing companies. So and we, you know, we, it doesn't do us any good to go and buy an exploration company and, and, and spend two or three years drilling it and and then uh, another two or three years permitting it and another, you know, a couple of years um, uh, building a mine and, and uh, you know, and waiting, you know, five to seven years to get the first, you know, ounce of metal out of the ground. It's just, uh, um, you know, I'm not a geologist or an engineer and, you know, that kind of stuff just really doesn't excite me very much. You know, I, um, I like to buy Things that are undervalued, that are distressed, um, uh, that that, that uh, for whatever reason, um, 
you know, it's it's uh, there's an issue, a problem that that I believe that we could fix, and we've done it many many times. And you go back, you know, over the 18 years uh, history of the of the company, and look at our acquisition um, um, history, and you'll see virtually every single time we we bought assets that were that were somehow run down, out of favor, disliked. Uh, I needed money, needed a new look and feel, needed just new energy, um, needed time, uh, needed exploration. Our, our technical team had a particular view that they could achieve what they achieved, and um, you know, I, I, um, I trusted them with their um, uh, their due diligence, and it's worked out very well. I think we put together one of the you know best uh, silver portfolios there is in the entire silver space, and we're continually doing that, but. As we get bigger, it becomes tougher because you know, like Coeur d'Alene and Hecla and, and many of these other companies that have now become gold companies, they couldn't find silver mines, and, and uh, you know, we're going through that same challenge. And I'm trying to not get into the same situation, turning First and Jessica in, into a gold company. So, you know, M and A is is very um, uh, important to me, uh, and uh, but we're looking for you know projects that can produce you know five million ounces plus so if, it, if it's not mm-hmm. of that size then it's just not going to move the needle for first majestic in the case of, in the case of silver one um now that's that's interesting me because you know here's for one thing i love nevada um you know as a mining company jurisdiction is everything and and uh, you know i like mexico to even today you know Mexico is still a great place to be active in uh, as, a, as a mining company, but uh, Nevada is is probably even better than Mexico, quite frankly. Um, uh, permitting is is relatively easy. You know, it's a very um, uh, open state. Uh, the state's very knowledgeable about mining. Um, Nevada is called the Silver State, which is something you know I only learned a couple of years ago when I was getting involved in, in Silver One. And uh, um, we spun, First Majestic spun out, um, it's a, a, a small portfolio, I think three or four or five assets we spun out to them to create Silver One. And uh, they started doing some exploration uh, in Mexico on some of the uh, projects that we sold them, which, you know, quite frankly, First Majestic would have never got around to anyways. And uh, if Silver One was successful, we could always go and, and you know buy them back, I suppose, if it turned out. To be something bigger than what we, you know, um, originally thought they could be, but uh, nevertheless, um, uh, that hasn't happened yet. But uh, Greg Crow, who's the CEO, uh, decided to focus on Nevada um, after um, he, he purchased the portfolio from First Majestic, and uh, I think it was a fantastic move on his part. Uh, he's now accumulated um, an enormous land package in Nevada over two pro projects, one called Cherokee and one called Candelaria. I've not been to Cherokee. I've been to Candelaria, I think, uh, well, twice for sure, I think three times, though. And uh, uh, it's a big property. Um, there's mineralization um, everywhere, uh, two old open pits side by side, um, a bunch of heat pads sitting on the surface uh, with you know tens of million ounces of silver sitting on, on, on the ground. Um, there they've drilled, they have been drilling uh, to prove, um, you know, if there's additional underground ore available, which they're now proving that there is. And, uh, um, you know, it's now, you know, we're talking about, you know, how to get this thing into production and, and uh, you know, what's the next stage. And, and fortunately, they were able to raise some money recently before this uh, market uh, went sideways, but uh, they're well, they're well cashed up and, and, uh, they got a good management team and a great portfolio and a great jurisdiction uh, with you know a lot of silver uh, already defined, but a lot of blue sky there that's um, I think going to add a lot more ounces and uh, I think it's going to be a producer ultimately and that's why I own it and uh, I'm willing to help out whenever necessary. Keith, as we uh, conclude here, any final advice in light of what we talked about uh, for our listeners today? Yeah, just uh, um, you know these markets are tough and 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 uh, you know just. Uh, uh, you know, sit back and, and uh, self-isolate, and uh, I wouldn't get too wound up with these markets because uh, this is all going to change as it did in 2002, 2003, as it did in uh, 2009, 2010. It's just uh, we've got to wait it out and uh, see how these markets evolve. But, um, you know, just make sure you've got 
um, some of your capital in gold and silver. And, and uh, I think that's what's going to protect all of us in, in, in the long run. You've been listening to President, Founder and CEO Keith Newmeyer of First Majestic Silver. Keith, as always, I appreciate your insights. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.